It is 9.02. I think we're actually going to kick things off and get going. Hello, Des Moines. Yay. I'm so glad that people are filing in. So I think we're just going to get rolling. I'm going to turn off the chat box uh, for a second so that I can focus. Um, I'm Rachel Baker, and I'm the moderator this morning. I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm the moderator of this panel this morning. Um, I work with the Haas Leadership Initiatives. We invest in the leadership and capacity of social justice organizations across a variety of different movements. And it is such an honor to be here today to help organize this panel and uh, make an opportunity for you to hear from three uh, leaders from extraordinary organizations. And um, I'm just gonna take a few minutes at the beginning and tell you about the inspiration for this panel and a little bit about the format and then we're gonna dive right in. Um, so uh, we, as a, as a capacity builder and funder, we have kind of a window into um, an ear to ground into um, some shifts that we have been observing um, across the different movements that we've worked with over the last four years um, around the way that people are connecting with causes and issues um, in, in, in new ways, sort of new dynamics that are fairly unprecedented in terms of their scale and um, the speed and velocity at which they're happening, the way that it's uh, happening spontaneously sometimes. And we, we got a window into this through fundraising initially and saw right after the 2016 election, um, the way that uh, folks were donating uh, to organizations like the ACLU and Planned Parenthood and reaching out and becoming activated and showing up at the airports around the Muslim ban. And we were curious about that and wondered whether this was something that was just happening for name brand organizations that were sort of big and household names. And what we've discovered and watched over the last four or five years is that some of these dynamics, that this really is beyond the Trump bump, that they have continued. We're seeing them around Black Lives Matter. We saw them in Me Too. We've seen them around a variety of different immigration issues. And as you will hear today, it's not just something that, uh, is happening for national organizations, but also uh, smaller and regional organizations have been able to tap into some of this uh, kind of energy. And so really what this panel about is about is, um, this is emergent work that draws on communications and fundraising and organizing in new ways. And um, I don't think that while there's some fabulous consulting organizations, I don't think they have the only corner on the market in terms of how to do this work. In fact, you know, a lot of the innovation and, and uh, you know, um, really a lot of the innovation is happening in organizations that are at the front lines, figuring out how to tap into and leverage this kind of energy through trial and error. And I know my colleagues on the panel would want me to say that they're not the, they don't see themselves as the experts with all the answers around this issue, but they are trying and experimenting with some, uh, with this way of trying to capture lightning in a bottle, which is a metaphor we're gonna use a little bit. And that's what you're gonna hear about today, some stories. So without for further ado, I would like to uh, quickly let you know about the format. We are gonna hear from, um, Tamara Tolzo Laughlin from 350.org, from Javier Hernandez from the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice, from Juanita Monsalve from United We Dream, and also we have the pleasure of having Adela de la Torre, who is a consultant who used to be the communications director at the National Immigration Law Center and has been my partner in organizing uh, this panel. And we're gonna have about half an hour of um, of stories and, uh, ob and observations from the panelists. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So there's a Q&A box at the bottom, which is different than the chat box. So please feel free at any time during the panel to drop in your, your questions. Um, and then we are going to, um, after the Q&A, we have to wrap up uh, right on time or they're gonna they're gonna go dark on us. So we're gonna try to balance a sense of spaciousness with the stopwatch, which is not easy, but we're gonna do our best. And, um, and finally, we really wish we could hear directly from you. 
Um, if we were in a room together, we would be doing that and we'd be having more conversation because we know that you also have ideas about this and we'd love to help crowdsource those. So we're going to drop a, a Google Doc or Google Form into the chat box periodically this morning. And please share your ideas about how to leverage these kinds of lightning in the bottle uh, moments to build long-term power and sustainability. At the end, we will collect them all and we will share them back to everybody who attended this panel or who, who signs in later to NetRoots. Adela, did I forget anything? No, excited okay. to start the conversation. All right, we're gonna dive right in then and I would like to ask the panelists if you would just do a quick round and introduce yourself starting with Tamara. As was stated, I'm Tamara, the North America Director at 350.org. I'm also an advocate for people and planet. And despite my background, which suggests I'm hanging out on a canal, I'm actually in Baltimore, Maryland, where I live. So glad to be here. And I'll pass it over to my co-panelists. Hello, everyone. Javier Hernandez, uh, the Executive Director of the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice. Uh, we are in a coalition in the Inland Empire, so Southern California, in both Riverside and San Bernardino County, and I am in Ontario right now, Ontario, California. Great. Thank you, Javier. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juanita Monsalve. Uh, I serve as United We Dream Senior Marketing and Creative Director. Uh, previously, I served as the digital and creative director, um, and my pronouns are she and they. I am currently in Washington, D.C. No, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but I recently moved here from Washington, D.C., only like two weeks ago, so bear with me. Um, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, really glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Let's just dive right in. Juanita, will you start us off? I've, I've asked the panelists if they could each share a story about a, a, a movement moment that mattered uh, for their organization and some of what they and their colleagues did to galvanize the energy in that moment. Yeah, um, so uh, I, I think one of the most important moments for us during the Trump administration specifically had been the big announcement that, that Trump was ending DACA. And for folks who don't know what DACA is, DACA stands for Defer the Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, and it's a program that immigrant youth won and fought hard for during the Obama administration, which allows young people who uh, came here to the United States without documentation uh, to receive access to a work permit and to be safe from deportation for two years. So uh, some young people are able to apply, about 700,000 people, and they have to apply every two years and pay almost $600 to receive it. So it's very expensive and it's an arduous process for them to go through. Um, and so Trump based a lot of his campaign, obviously we know on his <laughs> hate for immigrants, but one of his campaign promises has been to end DACA. And so um, we clearly had a hint uh, soon after November of, of 2016 that this was coming, right? Uh, and so we were like, oh my God, is it really going to happen? What is going to happen? Um, and we moved very quickly into a tool that I think is extremely important for capturing any lightning moments and I want to emphasize, which is scenario planning. And I know a lot of the time we're like, we have no idea what could happen, but I think it's also about trusting ourselves and trust and putting ourselves as strategists into the, the like space of, if I was evil, what would I do, right? But also thinking all of our knowledge and advocacy, what are the pathways in which they can do this? So we spent a lot of time uh, thinking through that and working through that. And one of our realizations was really, we don't have to play their game, right? And really, I would say, as we sat thinking through it, everybody expected us to fight for DACA. And for us, there were two things that I think are really important for any lightning moment. One is for us to continue to center our people, right? And think about, um, about them. And then the other one is to ask ourselves, what we asked ourselves is, is not what's politically feasible, but what does our community need? And from that question, at that time, we were able to think through, wait, we don't wanna fight for DACA. Like, that's cool and all, and it's super important for our communities, but this actually offers us up an opportunity to expand the web of people that can come with us 
um, that we can protect and that we can secure. And so that gave birth to us actually using that moment and that energy to launch a fight for a new DREAM Act, a clean DREAM Act that was more expansive, that didn't actually ha exchange um, safety and protections for immigrants while putting other immigrants in danger. And so it was very much a moment of saying, you want us to play your game, you want us to um, be exchanged for more enforcement, for more agents, but we're not going to play that game. We're actually going to go and move the wave the other way. Um, and we're going to bring an opportunity for all of our community to have a different conversation. Uh, and we're going to center our stories um, to be able to galvanize and hold people to the, to the values question and the moral question that we really need to be asking ourselves with Trump. I, and so through the Dream Act campaign, it was a moment for us to be able to build on that energy. The other thing that I'd say it allowed us to do, which would, would not have been possible, was actually take that opportunity and again, thinking what resources can we bring to our community and launch a brand new thing, which was the DACA Renewal Fundraising Program, the DACA Renewal Fund. And through that fund at this point, we've been able to raise more than $2 million. Prior to this moment, no one would actually provide people money to go pay $600 for their renewal, right? It was an uncommon thing. And so for us in the movement, the conversation was like, well, there, there's this new urgency and we can use it to actually teach people why the DACA renewals are important, that they're so expensive and to actually work with young people so that we're encouraging them to renew before anything else happens, right? And as long as we're fighting this battle and trying to keep the renewal there at the very least, um, we're able to use this moment to think of how can we bring resources to our people. Um, but the other piece that I want to say that I think is really important is that we always think of the bump as one thing, like one moment. But um, I, I think that losses often are in themselves bumps. And so uh, like bumps of Bear with us for a second. We have an internet glitch. And that was a very suspenseful moment, waiting for Juanita to tell us more about how losses are bumps. All right, I think, let's hold that thought. We're gonna come back to Juanita and later with the suspense of how losses can be bumps. Um, and, okay, and also um, maybe I'll just say a word about what we mean by sort of tr Trump bumps or even um, Tamara, as we, can we transition over to you and maybe you could say a word about uh, how we're thinking of bump, no, okay. So um, we're gonna transition, we're gonna uh, go for a second to Tamara, but let me say a word about bumps, which is that um, these moments that, that Adela has coined as lightning in a bottle moments is what we mean by the bump. And that is like a moment of visibility around an issue and kind of galvanized action that is happening around an issue um, when often there's an influx of new supporters, uh, a, a broader audience, the base expanding, these kind of movement moments that are happening rapidly in this environment. And then this, this question of how to capture that energy, the lightning in the bottle and leverage it for the long term. And we will come back to Juanita to hear about um, how losses can also be moments to leverage. But I think while she's um, getting back on board, maybe we can go uh, pass to Tamara to share some stories. Sure, and I'll just say that was an excellent explainer on a bump. I feel like it was a pop-out bubble and we needed it just to make sure that I think sometimes it can be measured in terms of dollars. Uh, people show up and they want to throw, they're anxious, so if they have any money at all, they throw it into a cause that cares about it as a way to level out your, your emotional state. So just really flagging that. Um, it can take on so many meanings, but it just says who's looking at you because you're doing the work. And it feels like Juanita just jumped back in. So want to... Juanita, are you ready to finish before I jump in? Yes, I'm sorry, Tamara. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm joining from my phone now. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We're keeping it real. But we'd okay. love to hear, you were just, where you got cut off, Juanita, was you were just talking about how losses can also be moments. Yeah, definitely. And so I think it's very much, I think people think that it's all about Trump and what he does, but I think that we need to think of it instead about how we are creating moments. And so when we lost the DREAM Act, part of our conversation with our membership was like, what's next, right? The realization that 
we need to continue our fight. And we have all of these people, right? Like through the Dream Act campaign, it's the first time that the movement was able to bring more than a thousand young undocumented people to take over Congress various times, right? Like we camped out outside of Congress, right? So there's all this energy that we have built up and it was clear to us that we could not lose it. Um, and so through our, that, those conversations with our membership, we knew that the next thing that it, it's important for us, right? Like the other pathway to, um, to, to certainty and protection was actually abolishing ICE. And so at the same time, the country is going through this moment about the children being caged at the border. I, I assume most of you heard about it. Um, and so for us, again, thinking about, it's not about what the Trump administration wants us to drive. This is an opportunity for us to, uh, yes, people hate Trump, but this isn't about Trump. It's an opportunity for us to continue to unveil what's been happening for years and to have a wider conversation. And so for us, that became an opportunity to talk about not just getting children out of cages, but to actually close the camps and abolish ICE and continue to reuse that energy to continue to once again think about not just what's politically feasible, what does Congress want, what are they willing to talk about, but what do our communities want to talk about and what do we care about? Um, and so I think that for us, it's a war in terms of the narrative, right? Like who is controlling what we, what we as a country are talking about and caring about? Um, and so I think it's very important to be thinking of those <clears throat> bumps and opportunities, excuse me, <clears throat> oh my God, everything that can go wrong is going wrong. But, uh, but yes, so I think that um, continuing to think of it as, as, a, as a timeline, as a sequence that is continuing and not just one bump, but always how you're continuing to move and work with folks is extremely important. Um, I think, yeah, thank you, Rachel. That is great, Juanita. And thank you so much. You've talked about, raised a lot of really um, important ideas about scenario planning, about centering communities while expanding the web, about connecting these dots. And um, as I hand it over to Tamara, I just wanted to say that um, one of the things I think that's exciting about the panel is that we are talking across movements and Tamara is gonna talk even intersectionally across movements, I think, as, as she shares her story. So um, Tamara, I'm gonna pass it to you. We'd love to hear. Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to flag that we're in a lightning in a bottle moment. You are lightning. The bottle is everything that's shaking around you. So just wanted to help everybody get grounded and centered in the fact that like, if there is a kid or a cat uh, learning or living, if your family members are living in the same space as you are, as you're trying to figure out how you're going to strategically <laughs> and tactically plan to get enough groceries without coming in contact with anyone, you are in the middle of the kind of thing we are talking about. So I just want to make sure that the folks on the other side of this conversation don't feel like they are excluded and wanted to bring that in and just say that like in the we are in this moment of massive solidarity with Black life. Uh, I've been calling it climate for Black lives. And there is a connectivity that people see between organizations who care about climate, uh, people who are um, unaffiliated, unbanked, unchurched bus drivers, people delivering groceries and hoping not to come in contact with anyone. All of those folks are striving at the same time for really basic humanity. And the reason that's coming together is because Moving for Black Lives stood up to to, to capture it and capture this moment, but also because uh, Black people, uh, real allies and humanists from every stripe. I mean, I heard there was witches involved, you know, so, so I so we're at a moment where humanists of every stripe are working within the innermost parts of the work to make these connections real. So it's not just a bunch of folks agreeing with each other in their minds and keeping the status quo. They're getting out into the streets every day, even when the media isn't covering it, uh, mostly to make sure that we do don't forget that this moment is lightning in a bottle. I want to flag that the moment for Black Lives wouldn't have happened without struggles for um, a Dakota Access Pipeline or KXL. All of those moments delivered us to a place where the public consciousness stopped seeing uh, standing up for your rights in black and white. <laughs> um, the imagery that you think of around the civil rights movement appears in your mind like you're in a um, 
like you're in a museum, but in real life, it looks like what we have been seeing. Uh, calls that move us from uh, really institutional level divestment to institutional defunding. Uh, they, what they have in common is that there are placeholders put in place by organizers and um, uh, community activists and people who just are tired of it acting as placeholders for the demand to move away from extraction and degradation to investment in people in a new and visionary economy. So I just want to flag that like you're in it. Uh, so when a movement or uprising is happening, everyone is being called to respond, to align your energy and your work to serve the moment rather than just uh, yourself, um, to send some, to do more than just write a statement that says, I agree that X shouldn't happen. Juanita really touched on that, how moving people towards action and picking your spots for tension building are really huge ways to capture that kind of energy relationships delivery systems they're all relays that we use to communicate with each other to say it plainly the dynamic movement that we're in is based on a lot of groundwork that you do not see intersections that don't get made in public where we pitch in and do our part and show up with the resources that we have uh, recognizing that that climate strikes for um, the time framing that I'm setting between KXL and Movement for Black Lives Uprising 20, the 2020 edition uh, is climate strikes. So just last year, September, who knew that would be the middle of the struggle? Lord. Uh, but, but, we, but we saw 7.6 million people get in the street over the course of a week from wherever they were in 185 countries, which means there were only two where people did not strike for climate two countries so if 100 people can get find a way in 185 countries to stand up they put um uh, they pressured 800, over 8,000 businesses to go dark during climate strikes. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of websites that missed out on commerce to say you should get back out there into the streets and not be in here buying your way out of, out of thinking about your problems. So collaborating across the sectors that we work in, recognizing that the voices and validators have to be from every space for people to see themselves in the work, and then working really discreetly to make sure everybody has resources to show up because losing your life is hard enough, but starving in the name of justice is really a foul thing that happens all the time, which is why having a conversation that includes folks who bring money to the table is a really important way to capture lightning in a bottle because all the invisible digital infrastructure, the mapping, the coordination, the water bottles, the bandanas, it all happens because philanthropists show up to give us the resources that allow us to move people. So uh, tons we could say about that, but we have a great group of folks, but just wanted to flag that like, we're in this moment, we will be in this moment, uh, between somewhere between mid-November, we'll still be in this moment. So looking forward to continuing to have this conversation. Thank you so much, Tamara. I super appreciate how you helped talk about uh, sort of lifted up, helping people make connections across issues. Um, one thing might be an entry point, but helping them make the kind of connections, um, helping shape the narrative, um, just uh, the groundwork that goes beforehand, super important. Thank you so much. So we're going to go from a global organization and a kind of international climate strikes that Tamara talked about to a regional organization that is doing incredible work in the inland part of California, Javier. Hello, hello everyone, Javier. Um, Rachel, if you wouldn't mind sharing the slides. Yeah. So I, so the moment that I want to uh, talk about um, is specifically to uh, immigrant detention, um, specifically here in, uh, in California, we have, uh, in, especially in our, in, in our region, right, in the Inland Empire, we have the largest detention center in the West Coast. Uh, right now, the detention center holds 1,940 people, uh, and there is a proposed expansion that's actually going to be on the on the agenda for the um, city council next next week, no, in two weeks from now, uh, and so it'll be uh, one of the lar it might be the largest detention center in in the country uh, at twenty six. 2,650 beds. Um, and so that's, that's what we're fighting. But I want to give a little bit of background on, you know, why these uh, are, these uh, businesses thrive, right, in, in some of these regions. So uh, Adelanto is a small town um, here in, in the Inland Empire. Uh, their, you know, annual budget is about $10 million. You know, their city budget is $10 million, of which $1 million comes from the, um, the, the, the immigrant prison itself, right? And so uh, this campaign started back in 2011. And 
that was the first picture you saw of some, you know, young, just children uh, wanted to put up their signs and talk about, you know, that Adelanto was the unlimited, uh, the city, <clears throat> the city uh, with unlimited possibilities, uh, but it was for schools, you know, I'm sorry, but, there, you know, it was just nothing but jails and there was no schools, there was no high school, there was uh, one middle school. And so these children were like, there's prisons all around us um, because Adelanto is just one of four prisons that exist within that city. Uh, and so, yeah, these, these um, folks wanted to, you know, just you know, put that message out there. We can go to the next one. Um, through the work of the, of the, of the you know, since we started the campaign, uh, it has gained attention from folks um, like Miguel, Grammy winner Miguel. Um, he actually filmed one of his music videos at an event that we had. He came and sang to, uh, you know, he, uh, to the community. There was a free concert. Uh, thousands of people were there. Uh, and so if you want to see that video, it's uh, Miguel and the name of the song is Now. Um, uh, it's a beautiful video. It just highlights, um, you know, immigrant detention and, and the event that we had out there in Colorado, uh, sorry, out there in the detention center in Adelanto. We'll go to the next one. Um, so <clears throat> as you, so now, you know, we're, the moment, the lighting, you know, the lighting moment. So um, there's many moments, right? This detention center, and we all know that immigrant detention is horrible, and we know that ICE uh, just gives us these moments all the time, as Juanita, as Tamara said, we're living in, in this moment right now. Um, but recently, uh, you know, uh, one of our uh, leaders inside of the, of the detention center, uh, after the, um, you know, the pandemic started coming to the U.S., um, uh, I decided to start using a chemical um, that was actually a toxic chemical that was only to be used in well ventilated areas or outside, right? Not, not for indoor use. Uh, and that was the chemical that they were using uh, to disinfect, you know, um, the detention center. Sometimes if folks were on their phone, on, on the phone, um, they would get sprayed as well. I mean, there was no respect. There is no respect, right, for human life inside of detention centers. Uh, and so when we heard about this, we, we put this information out. Um, so, you know, there was uh, more uh, folks were really starting to, uh, to, to listen to what was happening inside, right? Um, and so the, the Congress member called for an investigation. Then we had immigrants that were detained themselves that decided to take action, right? And they staged a peaceful protest inside of the detention center. And the response by guards was to pepper spray them. And they, uh, they were ready to uh, shoot the rubber bullets right inside from, from what we heard from folks inside, um, they were ready to just really go all out, uh, an all out attack against these folks that were detained because they were speaking out against the conditions because they were talking to us about what was happening inside and about this chemical use. Uh, we can go to the next one. So we go back one, sorry. So just there's a, one of the, you know, so because of the attention that this got, um, there were multiple, multiple, multiple petitions that came up. So we, we have one that was a petition directly to the White House. Then we had another one, this, um, if we can go to the next one, sorry. Uh, you know, another petition that, you know, just demand I stop using dangerous chemicals. Uh, and then the last petition that I, went, that I put on here, this one was the one that got the most support, right? 1.3 million signatures as of yesterday that I checked it again. And none of these uh, uh, petitions were by us, right? It was by other folks, other uh, folks that saw this and decided to take action. However, we were able to connect with them, right? And let them know like, there's other actions that you can tell your folks to take, right? So then we actually then uh, connected them to the campaign, you know, around shutting down Adelanto. And that was one of the, um, one of the things that we asked them to do was, you know, donate, ask your folks to donate so that we can get people out of this detention center, right? If we don't want people in there, the best thing to do is to pay their bonds. The problem is that bonds for immigration, uh, you know, purposes are thousands of dollars. They can be anywhere from $5,000 we've seen some at $80,000, right? And so it's a ridiculous amount to pay. <clears throat> and so we were able to raise enough funds to get about 10 folks out of detention um, in as since from April up to now, right? And we're still raising funds so that we can help folks out. Um, the last thing that I want to, yeah. So one of the things that came out of this, you know, campaign, right, was um, the person that, the, that gave us this information, his name is Jose Tapete. So he would call us, we would record the calls, uh, and then we were just, you know, putting them out there, right, saying this is what's happening inside. Um, <clears throat> we go to the next one. And what happened was that, um, as we know, ICE um, 
um, oh, this story just you know got so much attention that it was on Democracy Now, right? I think that you know media is great, but when you're in Democracy Now, like that's awesome, right? <laughs> so like that was like our moment for us to just realize, okay, this is great. You know, like uh, Univision, Telemundo, they're all great, but being a you know and Democracy Now for us was a big moment. Um, but the unfortunate thing that was we were on Democracy Now because. Um, I decided to retaliate against Jose Tapete. Uh, we can go to the next one, um, Rachel. Um, <clears throat> they actually uh, wanted to expedite his removal, right? He was one of the most outspoken people around this issue and they expedited his removal. They, um, they told his attorney, oh, you know, everything is exhausted. There's nothing else you can do. Uh, and then we, we put this, you know, we put his information out. Um, we had so many uh, folks that followed us, you know, after this went public. And our message was, if you're following us, because ICE, you know, because you found out that ICE is gassing, essentially gassing people inside of detention, the only reason we know about that is because of Jose. So we said, make a call, send a text message, uh, sorry, make a call or send an email today, right, to ICE asking them to stop the deportation of Jose. Jose was removed from his cell. Jose was taken into the van. Um, Jose was already processed to be deported. And last minute, right, a few minutes before the van took off, they, they got him out of the van and he's still here. He's still detained. But the fact is that uh, because of this moment for us, you know, the fundraising, all that is great. But the fact that Jose is still here and still has a chance to fight his case, that was our victory, right? And that we were able to get folks to take action. In 24 hours, we generated over 1,500 emails to ICE. Uh, and so um, that's, you know, that's amazing for being a, a small, not small, but like a, a, a regional or a coalition, um, generating 1,500 emails um, for Jose Tapete in 24 hours is why Jose probably is still with us today. Um, and one of the things that was great about that, part of our tactic was also to talk to the local uh, 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 Mexican consulate and say, deny the, the, the passport, right? This is a person that has suffered so much and him getting deported, just leaves eyes with, you know, they allows them to continue to do what they're doing because he is the only person that's willing to speak. And the consulate actually did deny the, the, the giving uh, Jose the documents to be deported. And that was also something that was helpful. And that was Thanks. our moment, yeah, our moment. Snaps, yes. Thank you so much, Javier. And it was so great to have the visuals. Um, the, I, 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 uh, I think a couple of things to lift up are the combination of, of the many different ways that uh, you've given people to uh, be engaged and take action, including lifting up other people's petitions, giving people opportunities to donate money to the bond funds, um, helping them direct their energy through emails, for example, to ICE. So really combining communications, fundraising, and organizing, and using social media in a really uh, in incredible, incredibly innovative way. So. Thank you for sharing these stories. And so um, it's 9 to 34, you know, I'm thinking we're gonna, let's go straight to a little Q and A, and then we'll make some time at the end to share some additional thoughts from the panelists about some concrete takeaways for you. But I think, um, Adela, do we have any questions that have come in yet that we could start with? Uh, we haven't, and just a reminder to submit a question, type into the Q and A bucket. Um, we don't have any yet, but what I can do is start with a, a question that um, that I have for the for the panelists while folks are are thinking. I mean, um, Tamara, you touched upon this a little bit, but um, we've talked a lot about the intersection of mobilization and communications, but obviously fundraising also plays a role. Um, so I was wondering if any of you had thoughts about how you make you're integrating those three strategies. Uh, I can start um, and say that you have to start at the campaign, at the level of building out a campaign or a response, even if it's rapid response and it's in the middle of the night and everyone's on Zoom in there, uh, hopefully pants, but probably shirt. Like you have to recognize that you can't go without the folks who are impacted. That means you cannot move without people being equally resourced to be in the space uh, to deal with the risk that comes so that they have protection. So just want to flag that like that happens because you have people in the building of strategy around how your work plays out that mirror the community you are in support 
of. So if you are doing it in a room and nobody in that room has experience, it's difficult to know what the outlets are that you might communicate with, what funders might be interested in holding that work, what people who can help you deliver great art or impactful communications or writing could do with the power that it takes. Um, impressed people have a lot to give, but they have even more to give when they get resourced. Um, yeah, I'll add a little bit, Javier, uh, if you, if you want to go as well, let me know. Um, I just, I want to like take a highlighter and highlight everything that Tamara said, um, particularly about having the people who are impacted in the room and being a part of this conversation, leading the conversation more than anything. Um, I would also say that for me, it's really important that we're treating fundraising as another outlet or form of organizing. And so we're not everybody is going to show up to your action. Not everybody is going to call to stop a deportation. And so we have to open the doors for people to take different pathways. Someone who donates is just as valuable as someone who makes that call, someone who shows up to an action. And so for me, it's really important to think of it as like all of those pieces are pieces of organizing and providing people the opportunity to take action along with us. Uh, and so always thinking about how are you opening the outlets and hearing from your members, from your people, what is it that they can or want to do is really important. Um, Javier, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, no, I think, um, again, so I think uh, for us, it was, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, with our staff, with our volunteers, with, uh, you know, with, with the folks that are working with us that, um, Sometimes we see us fundraising as something that, oh, that's only for management, that's only for the executive director to do. And here with ICAJ, we've been able to create a culture that says everyone is responsible for fundraising in one way or another, right? And so we have, uh, and we also make it simple for folks to, to donate and to get involved. One of the things that, one of the tools that we use is, um, and I texted here, um, one of the, First things that we say when folks want to like learn more about the campaign, we say text Adelanto to 797979. So if y'all want to do it now too. Um, and the first thing that we say is learn more about the campaign here and then it takes you to a link with a lot of actions that you can take. But in that text, there's two action, two ways to donate immediately. You can, you know, Venmo, and there's also a link that takes you to a, within, where you can donate. Um, and so you know, I feel that for me, right, it's like if we're asking our staff and our volunteers and our community members to to ask for donations, to ask, you know, to, to make sure that they're asking for donations and, and asking folks to be part of this, we also have to make it simple for our folks to, to do that ask. And so, uh, so this is an easy way for us to do that, where we just, you know, we talk about the campaign and we say to learn more, to donate, text Adelanto to 797979. There's two ways to donate there. And that has been super helpful, right? Making it simple and easy for people to donate um, has been a good way, yeah, to, to, to really just, um, uh, yeah, to get people engaged and involved in this work. And now that we're living in a uh, digital world, right, we, we're, uh, we have to take advantage of all these tools that we have. Um, and we also use this, you know, this texting system, well, 797979. We have multiple, like, keywords that we use for different, for our different programs that we have. Sometimes it's just, like, information, right? So, like, during COVID, um, folks wanted uh, resources. So we did resources to 797979, recursos. So it's just like making it simple for folks to get involved and also making sure that folks are um, able to, um, um, to donate and feel like they're part of something bigger, right, and part of this campaign. That is so awesome. I want you guys to know that Javier is not kidding. The, in the chat box is a way that you can actually live go ahead and participate in the kind of uh, taking action that Javier is talking about. And also, I'd like to share that, um, that Javier, you've done this not only with sort of allies, right, and, and small donors, but also um, have done it uh, with um, members of the immigrant community themselves who help donate very small, sometimes very small amounts of money, in, but very meaningful to help people with bus fare after they were dropped off by Border Patrol, uh, for example. So this way of in giving people multiple ways of taking action, including donating, um, can, is something that can be extended to everybody. So um, we actually had a question from somebody, Margie Find, asking if this, uh, asking about whether staff are um, ready to work in this way, in, in new ways of integrating, organizing, and fundraising and communications. And that gives us an opportunity, maybe also, if any of you have an idea, because we didn't want this all to be successes, but to be um, transparent about some of the challenges of working 
um, in some of these new ways. So do any of you have thoughts about our staff ready? Where do sometimes we run into potentially resistance? Sure, I can jump in and start. Thanks, Juanita, Mark. do you wanna go first? No, go for it, go for it. Okay, um, yeah, I just wanna say that I think that's the difference between the old way of working and the new way of working. The old school way of working is command and control and the way that the future, the future is much more collaborative. <laughs> it has a lot more black and brown people also just going to flag that. But um, but, but just want but just want to say that like the idea that one person is the holds the master key to how to work happens is a is a mistake of history. That was never true. It always took groups of people doing work and have and working a strategy together to get it done. So the idea that organizations have siloed those interests into specific bodies rather than having a round table where people meet and everybody takes their piece is is the difference between like a successful strategy where people feel rewarded. And that doesn't mean everybody knows the same thing, but what everybody knows is that somebody else has another piece of the work. Thanks, Tamara. For sure, I completely agree. I think for, for us at United We Dream, um, the grand majority, if not all, of United We Dream staff are young, undocumented people, uh, whether they hold DACA or not, or at the very least, people who hold the undocumented experience like myself. Um, and so for us, it's really important, one, to trust on our people, trust our instincts, but also make sure that we're all coming together. And so I just say, like, make the time make the time to have that staff meeting where you're just going over the questions, you're going over the strategy. Let people know that they are the strategists, that they have to take ownership over this, right? Um, and, and hear what they are thinking because a lot, and, and I think being open really to creativity is super important. People have new ideas all the time. Um, and often if we don't ask the questions, if we don't make time for that meeting, even for me, with the digital team, even if it's like every morning for 10 minutes going over like what's in the news, let's discuss it, let's think about what this means for our strategy, let's be creative together. Um, those moments are so valuable for us to instill our people. Our job is to provide them the tools and they will make the strategy, right? Um, they, our people are geniuses, they're amazing. And so we need to be able to, to give them the space to do that. I would also say, um, Integration and coordination, like Tamara was saying, is so central. Having all people in the room, a lot of the time, digital people are left out, operations people are left out. Having them all come in and be strategists together with the people in advocacy is so important and essential. And then finally, I'd say less is more uh, is super important. I think sometimes we think we have to have the biggest campaign possible. Um, but I think, Javier, like you were saying, the success that you had with your deportation defense campaign and with the Adelanto campaign could be seen as unprecedented, but um, all of the work that you did didn't require millions of dollars, um, but you were able to have huge impact, right? Um, so I, uh, those are the things I'm thinking about. Thank you, Juanita. Um, you know, maybe uh, let's just take, let's go back quickly to um, an opportunity for each one of you to share kind of a concrete um, suggestion, something that has worked for your organization, a takeaway that you might have um, for folks around building the longer, like sort of leveraging these episodic um, ways that people are engaged to build a deeper relationship and engagement with supporters. Like, what are you doing to kind of uh, help translate and sustain this kind of energy and deepen engagement with people? Do, do any of you have a thought about that? And Juanita, you talked a little bit about understanding who you're uh, serving that your supporters. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's really important for you when you're getting new people in, not everybody's going to be on the same page. Not everybody's going to fully understand your issue. And so the very first thing I would recommend, it's like, find out who are these people? Why did they get here, right? Like, what is it that brought them here? What's their interest? And then from there, begin to think about how you're going to connect them, how you're going to provide them the resources so that they do learn. Not everybody that comes into United We Dream thinks that we should or can abolish ICE, right? They come in thinking like, oh, the poor DACA kids. But it's really about so much more than that, right? Um, and for us, it's not even just about getting papers or getting citizenship. It's about actual liberation for all of our 
people and particularly black and brown people. And so for us, it's really important to do that survey as you bring them in, get to know them. Um, and then the other thing I would say is if you don't talk to them, they will leave. And so when Javier and Tamara were saying like, we do text messaging, we do email, we do all these forms of conversation. Um, if you don't talk to them and you don't listen to them, uh, digital organizing is no longer about just throwing things out there at people. It's about actually listening to them. Uh, then they will leave. And so I think that those things are really important. Thanks, Juanita. Yeah, if I can just add, um, yeah, so, I mean, you know what Juanita just said? Um, it's all, um, it's, yeah, it's about engaging, it's about conversations, it's about not just always asking them to do something. Sometimes it's also like, here's what we're doing, right? Uh, one of the, where we saw like another, and uh, we like to, um, the way, when I, when I see fundraising, sometimes I also say like, we have to make sure that folks know that, um, that where their funds are going. So we have to show and, and, and show that, right? So we, if we're saying we're fundraising for a bond, then in, 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 in a week or two, we have to show like we're actually paying for these bonds and here, you know, here are folks that have been released. If we're saying we're paying for commissary, we have to show that we are paying for commissary and that folks are receiving their fund, you know, that, that, that the funds that they're donating. One of the other things that we're also doing, um, you know, because we're a regional, regional more um, or coalition, we're actually providing, uh, you know, we were able to raise a million dollars to give financial assistance to undocumented folks here in the Inland Empire, right? And we, um, and so we send out like, this is what we're doing. And I, this is a moment where I realized like, oh, I like, I should, you know, we didn't ask for donations that time. We just said, this is something that we're doing. We just wanted like, let you all know all of our followers, right? We're, we're giving folks literally direct assistance, right? That are undocumented that, that right now are in need. And what, um, the, what we got back was, where do I donate? <laughs> where do I donate for this? And that was a moment where I realized that I, you know, I could have been fundraising for that. Um, but also like, I felt like, well, it's good to just let them know we're, we're doing this and, and it's part of, part of the work that we do. And thank you for your support. You guys have done such an amazing job at ICIJ with the sort of telling people, not, as you said, not just asking, um, but also telling people what happens to the end of the story. Like you've engaged people at the beginning and then as you showed in your slides, that thank you slide that you maybe didn't get a chance to, to speak to, but that like, you know, letting people know um, how their activism has made a difference, whether it's donating or contacting ICE, for example. Um, I may have made my last question a little too narrow, so I just wanna, make it broader if you have some sort of takeaways or tips that you'd like to highlight. I think we have, this is a good time to kind of go around and share any of those before we get towards the end of our panel time. Tamara. Sure. Um, I'll say that we should be looking at resources dynamically in the same way that the environment as an establishment or people who care about progressive work as an established set of NGOs has to learn to recognize that people are experts at lots of things uh, with or without credentials. Expertise is about, about how you interact and analyze what's happening around you, not just who gave you a piece of paper and how shiny it is. So I just wanna flag that resources themselves come in the form of a secondment. So uh, send in staff to work with folks who are uh, don't have um, the same access to information, um, sharing your tools is a set, is a resource that happens amongst organizations and community groups all the time. So if we have access to researching every single legislator who you might want to talk to, we don't use it 24 hours a day. So how many different groups of folks can we share that with? That way they have access to that same information. And when we come together as a coalition, we're able to plan our tactics with more uh, specificity, uh, recognizing that unified messaging being about somebody who's not just you uh, throwing in for uh, for to an adjacent issue that's only seen as separate because you don't have people working across the work like focusing on unified messaging and unified calls for action so demanding that people get as much respect for the thing that they're fighting for as you want for your own work and it wouldn't be 350 if we weren't down for collaborative activist art art artwork so so most of what uh, people see uh, isn't the number 350 all over the place but it's lots of murals where people are making de demands or um, drawing pictures of the things they care about or they're fighting for or uh, watching people in living color walking down the street um, representing what they care about so all of it goes down to old school organizing but just wanted to flag that like all of these things are in fact resources and if you don't have you can lend and if you can't and if and if you and if you can lend you should be giving some stuff away 
Thank you, Tamara. Um, I think we've ex really expanding the thought about what resources are and what action is in, in all of what you guys have shared right now. Juanita and Javier, do you have any um, additional sort of thoughts or takeaways for folks about what's worked or what, what you've tried that hasn't worked? Anything you want to? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, you know what? I would say don't be afraid of trying things out. I mean, one, I will definitely re emphasize think not just about what's politically feasible, but what about what your community needs. Be accountable to your community, to the people who are being impacted. I think that that is necessary in taking advantage of any bump. But once you've done that, I, I'd say like, don't be afraid of trying things out and, and, um, and real and like learning from it. One of the things that I'll share that I don't think was successful is um, our executive director, our previous executive director, Christina Jimenez was chosen to be a person in Time 100's uh, magazine. And um, I tried to test it out as a fundraising moment and whether I could make a bump or build momentum off of it, right? Um, and what I learned was that our, our audience was not as interested in that, right? So we didn't, um, we didn't actually, uh, were able to really raise as many funds, maybe a little bit out of that work that we did to try to accompany this big moment of, oh, time 100. But I think it helped, helped, allowed us to understand who is our audience a lot more and what is it that moves them to take action, right? And so although it didn't raise thousands of dollars, there was a lot that we learned from trying that out uh, and seeing who is out there and who is interested in doing this work with us. Um, so I would, I would again say, find out who your people are, continue to keep your audience in mind and be accountable to your people. Um, and, um, and remember that it's, it's in many ways a battle for the narrative um, and, uh, and for the way in which our people are, are rewriting history. Uh, so centering those stories is important as well. Thank you so much, Juanita. We are up towards the top of the hour. So Javier, maybe there's time for one more, one more parting thought from you. Yeah, I, I just want to remind folks, you know, if you're a part of an organization, um, creating a culture where everyone is a fundraiser, where everyone is able to talk to media, where everyone is mobilizing folks. Um, we can't just put folks into one department. We can't put folks into just, you know, a, a vision of like, you only do this. It's like everyone does everything. It's a different capacity, right? We can't expect an organizer to raise like, you know, thousands of dollars, uh, but sometimes they can, right? We've seen that happen, uh, but also uh, just understanding that it's everyone's, um, you know, everyone has a role in fundraising and media and mobilization, and that it's not just one or two, three people doing that. Um, and let's create that culture and that, that shares in the, that responsibility. Thank you, Javier. So I, again, want to invite everyone, you, I know you all also have ideas. So um, we're gonna drop in the chat box again, a Google form. And if you have additional ideas about um, along these lines, please, um, please share them and we will compile them and um, make them available to people who attended this panel. <clears throat> and also um, our panelists' Twitter handles are available on their, uh, on the Netroots app, so you can follow up with them if you want, and that's how you can connect uh, with them. And um, we also will try to uh, recap some of the really amazing ideas that have come up in this panel and distill them and can share that as well. So tune back in um, to the Netroots um, platform to get access to that um, after, the, after the conference. So I just wanna thank everybody so much for joining. And um, I want to also tell you that there is a panel this afternoon that kind of builds on some of the integration of communications and fundraising that was raised today. Um, and that's at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern time, and it's called Transcending the Tweet. And it is a training with practical tips and skills for improving the integration between communications and fundraising. So you might wanna, uh, to, to dial into that. And so I think that, that this gets us to the uh, 
end of our hour. Thank you so much for joining. And please join me in the chat with a round of what would have been applause and snaps for our amazing panelists, Tamara, Javier, and Juanita. We're so grateful to you for preparing for this panel in the midst of everything, for sharing uh, what you're doing, and also to Adela Torre, who has been uh, the co-conspirator uh, in creating this panel. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everyone, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I think we'll just leave it up until they they pull the curtain on us uh, at at um, ten o'clock, so you can still um, chat or access the the Google document. Thank you again. Thanks so much, Juanita and Javier and Tamara. Really, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. We thank made you. It. We made Thank it you, this funny form format. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, Tamara and Javier. It's such a pleasure. Um, oh my gosh. Speaking to y'all. It, it's it's been good. Let's make it happen more often. Happy to yes. collaborate whenever we can. Super yes. supportive of, yes. of everyone here. Yes, yes. And thank you, Adela and Rachel, for bringing us together and yes. doing yes. back on this. Thank you, Adela. It was an honor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a great have a great conference, everyone. Bye. Bye.